Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Sheckman. It began as a crazy idea. DJs would get bored with music and start talking to the audience. They would take calls, tell stories, and even talk a little politics, sports, and pop culture. Early on, it produced some enduring national personalities like Gene Shepard and Brad Crandall, Long John Nebel, and Larry King and Barry Gray and Joe Franklin. It was known first as spoken word radio. Later, it would give way to an even more colorful and cantankerous cast of characters like Joe Pine and Alan Berg and Morton Downey Jr. Late night talk radio was, long before Alex Jones, the home of conspiracy theories about crop circles and animal mutilation. Talk radio moved to the big cities with folks like Don Imus and Howard Stern. In New York, Bob Grant would redefine the formula beginning in the early 70s, as he was literally the radio soundtrack that Trump grew up with. In fact, Trump's early racial attacks came directly out of the Bob Grant playbook. And then things changed. The Fairness Doctrine was a policy of the FCC that, quote, required the holders of broadcast licenses to present controversial issues of public importance in a manner that was honest, equitable, and balanced. The Fairness Doctrine would be repealed in 1987, and suddenly radio would be set up to have political power. Then in 1988, a little-known Sacramento newscaster and controversial talk show host named Rush Limbaugh would be let loose nationally. He took the freedom of being untethered from the Fairness Doctrine, combined it with the formulas that had already proved successful in talk, added conservative politics in a sardonic and entertaining tone, and the rest is radio history. It began 30 years ago this week, and it certainly changed the entertainment, news, and political landscape. We're going to talk about that 30-year anniversary of Rush Limbaugh now with my guest, Michael Harrison. He is the editor and publisher of Talkers Magazine, but he really is the go-to voice for understanding talk radio in America. Michael, thanks so much for being here with us on Radio Who, What, Why. It's a pleasure to be with you, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me on the program. It's hard to believe 30 years have gone by. And uh, it seems no longer than maybe 28 or 29 years. Amazing how time goes so fast when you're having fun. Indeed. Talk a little bit about your memories of how talk radio was different before Rush, before the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine. Well, before the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine, uh, talk radio was not as controversial and not as politically combative. Uh, There were um, very interesting subjects, and talk radio did exist. It was a small sideshow in the radio landscape. Uh, When talkers started in 1990, we called it the talk radio industry. And even then in 1990, it was just a handful of stations. Because doing talk radio was was not something everybody could do. There there was no um, mold, there was no uh, formula. So you had interesting characters around the country. Uh, They certainly weren't defined by their politics. They were defined uh, by their individuality and their uniqueness. They were curmudgeonly, and they had a lot of life experience, and they were storytellers. And um, they talked about everything from, um, well, women's sexuality. That was something they used to talk about. They talked about visitors from Venus who were, you know, disguising as humans. Uh, And uh, basically life lifestyle stuff, celebrity gossip, recipes, gardening tips, money. Um, It was the fairness doctrine. When that was repealed, it gave everybody the opportunity to talk about politics. Now, why didn't they talk about politics before? Because it was kind of vague. And if you talked about politics, you had to give the other side uh, equal time. You had to cover all the issues from both sides. And that proved to be something that was very difficult to measure. So people avoided it. So the the Fairness Doctrine, as a result, didn't create more diversity. It, It basically chilled discussion about politics. So before the Fairness Doctrine, lots of interesting topics and interesting people. After the Fairness Doctrine, the birth of news talk, political radio, and eventually station formats being uh, basically described by the kind of politics that they, uh, that they carry. It's interesting in looking at 
talk before the Fairness Doctrine. Some of it was political, but the political nature of it was almost personal. They were more ad hominem attacks for exactly the reason you talk about. You couldn't really talk politics because you had to represent the other side, but if you attacked somebody personally, you could kind of get away with that. There was almost more meanness for a while. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's an interesting aspect. I don't I don't personally recall that being prominent. Uh, I'm sure that existed, but there wasn't this ideological um, pounding that um, we hear today where it's it's general partisan ideological preaching to choirs. Uh, That's another thing. Targeted audiences uh, since the Fairness Doctrine uh, uh, was repealed. Um, Audiences Audiences are targeted by what their um, predisposition already is, and then the radio show is a confirmation of that predisposition. We're seeing that in newspapers, and we're seeing that beyond talk radio. As a matter of fact, talk radio inspired that uh, approach to commercial uh, news organizations uh, all across the board, where you target your you target your readership, you target your viewership, you target your listenership, tell them what they want to hear, and then just preach to the choir. It wasn't that way back before. Before it was you tell them what you think, and you hope that enough people find it interesting to follow you. When Rush started, there was also a way in which he made politics entertaining. There was a sardonic nature to what he did, which was political and partisan, but it was also fun, particularly in those early days. He was a comedian. Uh, Rush uh, has, over the years, taken himself far more seriously as his influence grew and as the the nation became increasingly polarized and politics went from a spectator sport to a blood sport. Um, So uh, Rush is still humorous, but just slightly. But when Rush first started, humor was a major part of what he did. And he could even be described somewhat as a conservative John Stewart. Uh, he was a comedian. He was very funny. And a lot of the things that he said were meant to be tongue in cheek. They were later interpreted as either arrogant or um, just him describing himself. You know, like I'm, I'm here with one half of my brain tied behind my back. Right. Uh, that, that, that pompousness, that arrogance was meant to be funny. Some of the um, some of the terms that he created were meant to be humorous, even uh, excellence in broadcasting, the EIB network that was meant to be a joke. You know, excellence in broadcasting network. It was it was a pompous um, type of a humor, but uh, it became uh, very much uh, what they call his network. <laughs> it, it, it's not a joke anymore. Uh, so so it's changed. But, yeah, he was a funny guy. And talk about his audiences, because a lot of the audience early on didn't necessarily take him with the same kind of humor. They took it seriously. They took the politics and what he might have meant as tongue-in-cheek or sardonic, they took it as the real thing. Yeah, they did. And um, uh, that happens. Uh, You can never assume uh, that people understand uh, nuance um, in emails or on radio. Uh, <laughs> some people take things very seriously. And things today, my gosh, things are taken out of context. People make jokes and they're taken out of context uh, because, see, what's happening now, Jeff, is that uh, people, uh, news organizations, radio stations, political parties, candidates seek victory at the expense of truth. So, People will take anything they can out of context or if it was meant differently or it was a nuanced thing or it was a joke, and they will do everything they possibly can to make it look like it's real. But you're right. A lot of people took it seriously, and I think Rush was probably surprised to a certain extent at um, the power of his words and uh, the following that he uh, created and uh, the influence that he began to wield, not just as a, um, an attraction on entertainment radio, but as a newsmaker himself. What is your sense and what do you remember about how seriously politicians took him in the late 80s? In the late 80s, politicians, uh, in the late 80s through the 90s, politicians took talk radio very seriously. And 
talk show hosts on small stations were getting major interviews with big politicians. Presidents of the United States were showing up on shows, candidates for president. Um, it, it really was very, very exciting in the early 90s, through the 90s. Uh, talk radio had a big buzz about it. Um, talk radio has been um, usurped to a large degree now by cable news talk television. Uh, which now has the big buzz. It's much harder now for talk show hosts uh, to get the kind of traction, the kind of attention, and uh, the kind of buzz and, and uh, you know, political uh, support uh, that they got back in those days. And also a case could be made before it really became the stationality, you know, the, 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 the branding of stations based upon ideology and partisanship, uh, when it was more populist, the Republican Party tended to support talk radio and pay attention to the talk show hosts much more so than the Democrats did. And that's one of the reasons that led to talk radio and the commercial band um, being uh, increasingly conservative. It, it, there's a lot of things that led to that, but one of them was that the Republicans got to jump on it and um, the Democrats did not. It's interesting, too, that you talk about the difference with, with television today. Even still to this day, even Rush, who some people claim is, is less relevant today, still has huge numbers com and huge numbers of listeners compared to, for example, Fox News. Uh, Rush, has, Rush is very relevant, and um, it's just that Rush has been around for 30 years, so he's not the new kid in town, and he's not the rising star. But, um, but Russia is extremely relevant, and uh, it is interesting that uh, television has this psychological uh, advantage over radio that, you know, I call it screenist envy. Everybody in radio thinks television is bigger, but in some cases, there are far larger radio audiences than some of these cable shows have on television. <laughs> that's something that's always, you know, astonished me, uh, that the power of television goes beyond just the numbers. It's television. Ooh, big deal. And, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, it's not quite uh, the way it seems in many cases. Gore Vidal once said in an interview that the two things you should never turn down is sex and going on television. <laughs> well, I could certainly uh, understand why he might think that. One of the other things that Rush did is he really created an industry. He spawned so many imitators, so many people that, that really, t and a lot of them that took hold in the talk radio business. Yeah, he, he if talk radio were rock and roll, he would have been Elvis Presley. Uh, if talk radio were golf, he would have been Tiger Woods. Um, you know, the trends go where the talent lies. And there's no question that the, the popularity and the, the sheer magnitude of his personality uh, became a, a magnet for um, AM radio. Uh, AM radio was having a terrible time uh, competing against FM when it came to music. And uh, Rush Limbaugh and, and talk radio came along at the perfect time to fit the need of uh, AM radio stations. And, and, and the older demographic, um, the baby boomers grew up with AM radio. The generations that followed them didn't. So there were a lot of reasons why talk radio blossomed on the AM dial. And it's unfair when you hear the statement that Rush Limbaugh single-handedly saved the AM dial and single-handedly set the tone for talk radio. Eh, that's not totally fair, just as it would be unfair to say that, you know, Elvis Presley was completely responsible for rock and roll, you know, or the Beatles were totally responsible for the 1960 uh, peace movement and psychedelic movement. There were major, major, major components of it. And, and Rush was the, the biggest player. But a lot of things happened simultaneously with Rush Limbaugh that set the stage for him as well. And a lot of people... Uh, filled out the gap and turned it into an industry and turned it into a scene and turned it into a genre of radio that not only saved the AM dial, a case could be made, it saved radio. Because um, while Rush Limbaugh and all of his imitators and all of these great talk show hosts of the 90s were rising to prominence and becoming household names, FM radio was giving up the franchise on personality. 
uh, was telling uh, disc jockeys to shut up and play the records, to read, you know, liners and uh, basically forego personality. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, we see the results of that today. Music radio plays a very minor role in the music culture and in popular culture, whereas talk radio, although people are always proclaiming that it's dead, <laughs> uh, talk radio is where the radio stars are. Household names. It's not just Rush. You've got Sean Hannity, you have Michael Savage, you have Dave Ramsey, you have uh, uh, even Alex Jones uh, created a radio style format on his online and he's on radio to become a, uh, a big name. You have all the people at Salem Broadcasting, you have Mike Gallagher. Uh, they're the personalities, uh, Dr. Laura Schlesinger. Uh, I could go on and on. The biggest stars uh, in radio are talk show hosts. Name a big disc jockey. What, you know, uh, Ryan Seacrest. Uh, I mean, with all you know respect to him, it's a it's a basically canned um, Hollywood type product. It, it doesn't play a role in the culture. What is your sense of how much Rush really created the business if he hadn't existed? What would have happened with talk radio even after the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine? Uh, it would have happened anyway. It just would have happened without Rush Limbaugh. Um, these are questions that are what ifs, and uh, you know, if uh, you're into quantum physics, there are parallel universes <laughs> where there isn't a Rush Limbaugh. Uh, so it, it, it's you know, what would have happened to baseball if there were no Babe Ruth? You know, what would have happened had Kennedy not been shot? Um, Rush Limbaugh played a major role in it, but uh, there's something, it, it, it's kind of mystical how these things work. It's like fire was probably invented all over the world at the same time. Uh, the wheel was probably invented all over the world at the same time. Um, there's something in the human DNA. There's just something in the way things unfold that the time comes for something and the time is right and it happens. So I believe that talk radio would have happened anyway. However, it certainly did a lot better and uh, made a lot more impact having Rush Limbaugh in the, in the scene. One of the things that people talk about a lot with respect to Rush and, and conservative political talk radio is the way in which things have shifted over the years, and you've covered every step of this, the degree to which talk radio was influenced by the politics of the time or the way in which politics influenced what was happening on talk radio. Talk a little bit about that kind of symbiotic relationship. Well, that's the relationship between the media uh, and the news, uh, between the, the, the messenger and the message. Uh, this is deep media theory, and there is no clear-cut answer. It's like the mirror. You hold the mirror up, and you look at the mirror, and you see yourself, and then you say, hmm, my hair needs to be combed. So the reflection you see of yourself causes you to comb your hair, brush your teeth, take a shave, uh, for a woman putting on makeup. So the, the, the reflection changes the thing that's being reflected. And the media is a reflection of society. It is a reflection of the news. And in reflecting it, it influences it. Uh, you put a bunch of television cameras in a baseball game, and suddenly the baseball game becomes a television show. As a matter of fact, the presence of cameras anywhere turns whatever is happening into a television show. Look at the award ceremonies. They're not television shows. They originally were news events covered by TV. So the, the relationship between talk radio and politics is a great example of the two-way street of art imitating life and life imitating art and the power of media. But there is something else always going on that the media can't take it unto itself to control everything. You have to give and take, otherwise the public will leave you behind. The news will unfold, the river will turn, 
and the media will be left behind. That's why media does research. That's why media tries to figure out what the public wants. Um, radio is a fascinating medium in as much as it's extremely grassroots. It reflects the street. Going back to music radio, when rock and roll radio was really happening, they went to enormous efforts to know what are the kids listening to? What are the kids saying? We want to reflect that. We want to, pl we want to play songs they like. And then, of course, uh, by playing the songs, they would sell them and they would, they would be able to make a hit. But we used to have a saying in music radio, it's got to be in the grooves to be a hit. If, you, if you're preaching something or you're saying something, or you're playing a record or you're, you're talking about a political uh, opinion and it doesn't have it in the grooves, it's not already in the, you know, the, the public consciousness, you can talk to your blue in the face and no one's going to follow you. So it, it's a fascinating two-way street, and it's been at the very heart of what I've studied and talked about for my entire career, is that magical relationship between the media and the message that it carries. And it's also different, and you and I have talked about this a little bit in the past, different between radio and television, that there are very few guys that can be successful in both. Yeah, because it takes two different parts of the brain, uh, the, 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 um, the audio and the visual aspects of these media make them very philosophically and theoretically from a media perspective different. They're not the same game. It's like one is basketball and one is football. Uh, and you can be athletic, but uh, to be a major leaguer in both football and baseball or, you know, hockey and basketball, that's kind of rare. Uh, they all involve, you know, goals. They all involve speed. They all involve muscles. They, but they're, they're different games and they have it. They, they affect the, the psyche differently uh, and it takes a different mix of chemistry and abilities to do it and that's exactly the case with radio and television and that's why when you get a double, th a double threat like Sean Hannity who at the moment is on top of the cable news talk television world and on top of the talk radio world that's an amazing thing. That's uh, an ambidextrousness that uh, is very admirable and very rare. Rush Limbaugh wasn't able to really make it on TV. He did not translate to TV very well, uh, whereas on radio, it works uh, perfectly. Other people can do both, but they're stronger in one than the other. Yeah, I mean, Bill O'Reilly is an interesting case in point who worked on television, but not so much on radio. It worked pretty well on radio, but because it didn't work as well on radio as it did on television, it was deemed a failure. <laughs> he got a bum rap on that. Uh, he was not as good on, on, television, on radio as he was on television. Uh, and again, there's a visual aspect to TV. You see who you're talking, who's talking to you. You can look into their eyes. You can see what color their tie is. You could see whether the woman is good looking or not. There's so many, you know, there's a charisma, an X factor. But in O'Reilly's case, I don't think he put the kind of work into his radio show that he put into the TV show. I think he thought it would be a lot easier. Uh, and the show was fairly successful. It just wasn't, he wasn't number one. He was far from number one. And I think that um, didn't play well with his ego. And he fell short of expectations. But he wasn't a failure. He quit and he stopped on his own. Uh, you know, he, he could have continued. He, he was doing well enough to continue. Given how successful Hannity has been at doing both, as you've talked about, is that going to be the new paradigm? Will that have an effect on talk radio going forward, that, that people will have to be good at both? I think so. I think that, uh, I think that the screen, which is located on every... Uh, communications device we have today uh, begs to be used. And um, audio media, uh, music and talk radio uh, has a very, very special place in my heart and a very, very important place in 
human society. I hope it doesn't get trampled into the dust with this uh, multi-platform uh, convergence that's going on with visual, um, because it would be a shame, because as I mentioned earlier, there are two different games, and um, there's something very, very powerful about audio media for listening to music, for listening to the radio. You know, when MTV came on and they started to make music videos, a case could be made that that was the beginning of the end of really great music. And the reason for that was the record companies would never sign any musicians that weren't good looking. If you were ugly, you couldn't get a record contract once MTV came on. And let's face it, uh, a lot of the greatest musicians that have ever lived were not that good looking. <laughs> it's, it's like suddenly you had to be attractive. And uh, it's the same thing with television. Some great speakers, some great storytellers, some great uh, thinkers will be eliminated if they don't translate to the fact that there's a screen component and more and more radio stations are putting cameras into their uh, control rooms. And remember what I said about the camera, you put a camera into something, it becomes a TV show. And when you think about the, the, the fabulous production that Hollywood can do, a lot of these people have gone from making great radio to making cheesy television. And, um, this is a very peculiar and interesting uh, juncture, and I'm concerned about it because I don't want to see music for its own sake and talk for its own sake uh, basically left behind because of people's obsession with video. It also is a reflection, I think, of a broader trend that starts at the, at the top in terms of politics, starts in the White House in this case. So much of, of talk radio has been a reflection of who was in the White House. When we talk about those, those earlier Limbaugh years, the early 90s, into the mid-90s, it was so much a reaction to the Clinton years. And as we're seeing, you know, Hannity's success now, it is so much in sync with and a reaction to Trump and, and his fascination with television. Yeah, yeah, there's no question um, the president of the United States is um, one of the major pillars upon which modern talk radio and cable news talk television, which I consider to be two aspects of talk media, um, they're built upon that. And uh, Trump especially, Trump's the most talked about person of our lifetime. We've been studying this very carefully, and um, more people talk about Donald Trump uh, in the last two years than any two-year period people have talked about anyone. Maybe O.J. Simpson had it for a while <laughs> in the 90s. Uh, certainly Clinton was talked about a lot on talk radio, but we're talking about every format, gardening shows, local shows, everywhere. It's very hard to do a show without talking about Donald J. Trump, whether you love him or you hate him. This guy is uh, uh, addictive when it comes to copy and content and uh, just, just forget the politics of it and uh, forget about how wonderful he is or despicable he is. Uh, he certainly is gigantic when it comes to his uh, hold over the attention of a society that basically suffers from attention deficit disorder. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's miraculous. And, and what that says finally about the future of talk radio, when the president himself, the White House itself, is a reality TV show, when that sucks up all the air, what does it mean for talk entertainment? And talk radio. It means that it means that they're going to be talking about the White House and they're going to be talking about Trump until Trump runs his course, and then they'll be talking about something else. And that's a key, Jeff. This is a key question because when I started Talkers Magazine, it was right before the first Persian Gulf War, and when that war ended, people said to me, they asked me, "What's talk radio going to talk about now that the war is over?" And then when the big election of '92, that was a really colorful election. When that was over, what's talk radio going to talk about now that the election is over? And it's always, "What's talk radio going to talk about now that whatever it is, it's over?" And you know, when Trump is over, and Trump will be over, <laughs> it'll either be one minute from now, uh, two years from now, or six years from now, or any number in between. But Trump will eventually become yesterday's. When that happens, there'll be new stuff, and talk radio will be there because talking 
And when I say talk radio, I mean talk radio and talk television and talk internet and talk satellite and podcasting and all of the different permutations of talk shows. It will still be around because the human being, Homo sapiens, is the animal that talks. Yak, yak, yak. We are talkers and we are listeners and that's what we do. And this is a format that will never run out of material. Michael Harrison, it's always a pleasure. I thank you so much for spending time with us here on Radio Who, What, Why. Pleasure. Thanks for some really good questions, Jeff. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.